Um, and we are going to talk about GitOps and all the things. Now, what do you mean by all the things? And what I did was I pulled from last year, I pulled a, a slide from last year where we talked about kind of the principles of GitOps. And we pointed out that while we use these icons, we use YAML, we use Git, and we use Kubernetes as the icons for some of the key elements, kind of the key elements of GitOps, which is declarative configuration, version controlled, and software agents that do both delivery and operations, you know, runtime operations of our applications and how those all tie together, which hopefully you've seen across the various demos and conversations today, that while we use those icons, there's actually a lot more flexibility and a lot more openness. You might declare your um, applications and Nate talked about CDK earlier in something like TypeScript or Python rather than YAML. Now it still needs to be declarative and I'll talk more about that in just a moment, but we can use different things other than YAML. We can use other sources and Flux, for example, has sources that even allow you to pull from an S3 bucket. So I can pull from image registries. We saw a demo of that earlier. So there's a number of different sources that I can be drawing from. And then finally, the reconciliation, those software agents can be targeting, targeting a number of environments. They can be targeting the cloud. They can be targeting bare metal. They can be targeting a whole host of different things. So this starts to give you a little bit of a hint as to the flexibility. It's not just about Kubernetes workloads. This kind of hints at that. But let's be a little bit more concrete and say, well, really, what do you want to get ops? Well, the list goes on. We definitely want to um, uh, do Kubernetes workloads. So the very things that we've been demoing today where we're deploying pod info and that workload is getting deployed and running on my Kubernetes cluster. But I also want to get ops my cluster configuration. We just saw that in the demo a moment ago, which was where we saw things like the observability components and Flux itself as a component that gets installed and managed on the cluster. So if you will, that's the definition of the WKP platform is delivered as a set of cluster components and cluster configuration. Now it's not only components, it might be configurations like roles, role bindings, those types of things. So various policies, cluster policies are implemented into Kubernetes as um, a declarative configuration that's applied to the cluster. Kubernetes clusters themselves can be GitOps. Infrastructure. So what if I want infrastructure? And again, you probably saw a little bit of that earlier with the CDK stuff, which is I want to, in fact, GitOps my compute storage and network. Earlier today, I talked about the, the interfaces, the APIs that are available um, for uh, infrastructure. And I'll talk a little bit more about what some of those APIs look like. It's absolutely true that some of those APIs at AWS, for example, presented initially weren't declarative. I'll come back to that in just a moment. And then there can be a whole host of other services that are available that you're using as a part of your IT solutions, databases, search services like Elasticsearch, messaging, RabbitMQ, API gateways. What about policies? What about Rego policies? What if I want to get ops my OPA policies, identity and access management policies, and so on? So the reality is that you really can get ops all the things. But what does that mean? What we want is we don't want to manage each one of these things in a different way. That is probably the way that you're managing your infrastructure today. Is it Kubernetes workloads? You might be using GitOps. Kubernetes cluster configuration, you might be using some other imperative infrastructure as code. Clusters, you might be using EKS Cuddle. Infrastructure, you might be using Terraform. 
databases, search services, messaging, and some of those, those components, you might be using a different mechanism. What we are suggesting is that GitOps can be the consistent operational model across all the things. Now, does that mean I can just start doing GitOps? Well, we've talked a lot about the GitOps principles and I, I just showed you a slide from last year, declarative configuration versioned in an immutable store with software agents that are keeping things so. So as I'm going down that list of GitOpsing all of those things, I need to have the right elements to be able to apply the GitOps pattern across all the things. So let's start by looking at GitOps for Kubernetes workloads across this gambit. Well, Kubernetes gave us some things for free. All of the things that I've just overlaid over the top of this, the resource types of deployment, replica set, service, and more, those are all baked into Kubernetes. And the software agents that keep things running properly, those are also baked into Kubernetes, the deployment controller, the replica set controller, the service controller. And so what we've done in adding GitOps is we've overlaid over the top of this automation to do things in Git, like create repositories, create pull requests, and more. And then we've also added automation that bridges between the Git sources, Git and other sources, and that runtime environment that does things like watches for changes in source, does transformations, applies customizations, and delivers that. So these are all the things that are required. These are the, the, the elements that allowed us to get ops Kubernetes workloads. And I'll emphasize again that these are all done via reconciliation. It's all convergent automation. We've been up, um, emphasizing that for a while. Now, why are those controllers important? Well, just as a quick review, here's some of the reasons. First of all, we don't want to push things out into our clusters because that represents a security concern. Now I've got credentials to all of my different Kubernetes environments stored in some central CD system. We want to turn that around and instead we want to pull from the runtime environment, we want to pull the configuration in. Furthermore, I also want the ability to apply policies as a part of that. So I want to be able to author my policies and have those policies reflected in, in the clusters. So controllers support security. They also support repeatability. So we can stamp things out over and over and over again, either because I want to do things at scale or because I've had a disaster and I want to be able to stamp out a new environment very quickly. The controller plays an important role there in that it, it prevents us from drifting from the desired state that's in the Kubernetes, in the, in the Git repository. And then finally, we want to be able to do things at scale. So at scale means not two clusters or 10 clusters, it means 50 clusters or 1,000 clusters or 10,000 clusters. And in order to do that, we need to have each one of those environments converging against a centralized controlled place where that configuration is stored. So this is all about fleet management. So controllers are really, really key. Now I'm emphasizing controllers because controllers do play an important role across this entire life cycle. So if I take this up a level, the things that in order to get ops all the things, you're gonna need to answer the following questions. What are the resources and what are the controllers that are acting on those resources? And, and those are related, yes, but they're not necessarily CRDs. So, and I won't go into the low level technical details, but these things are definitely related, but they can be loosely coupled as well. And then the other thing that you need to be able to do 
is to program the GitOps automation for this particular life cycle. So again, to GitOps all the things, I need to answer the questions that are on the bookends and I need to program the middle. So now, ah, and program the GitOps automation. Well, if you watched earlier, I showed you one GitOps automation that was a simple pipeline like this, a simple GitOps automation that just retrieved from Git, applied a customization and delivered it to Kubernetes. But we might also want to retrieve from Git, transform into the custom resource. So for example, that's what I meant by the related. I might be storing TypeScript in my Git repository. And as a part of my GitOps automation, I need to apply a transformation to create the, the uh, uh, custom resource that we then deliver to Kubernetes because Kubernetes, of course, is operating on those custom resources. And then, of course, I could have a more sophisticated GitOps automation where I am, for example, monitoring uh, image registries and updating tags in my Git repository based on that. I just want to overlay, you can see that, again, there's controllers that support all of these different parts of the GitOps automation. So I'm going to skip across the GitOps runtime. So, well, in fact, let me pause here on the GitOps runtime. So when I talk about those two bookended questions and I talk about the GitOps automation in the middle, you can see that the GitOps runtime and the GitOps platform is designed specifically to support the GitOpsing of all the things. So let me come back to all the things and show you where we are at against some of these different resource types. So here we go again, GitOps for Kubernetes workloads and configuration. Remember that the configuration, things like policies, access control policies, things like that, are delivered to Kubernetes as YAML, as resources that are applied into um, the repository. In this particular case, the only thing that we need to do is program the GitOps automation. So we have a lot of those other things for free. So it's really, I get this for free out of the box with Kubernetes. I just have to program the GitOps automation. Now let's look at Kubernetes clusters. With Kubernetes clusters, we have the cluster API project. The cluster API project is defining the bookends. They're defining the resource types, the machine type and the cluster type. And they are providing base controllers and then the various Kubernetes, um, the cluster API providers, for example, for vSphere, Amazon, et cetera, those are providing the controllers. You install those things into the cluster and then you simply program the GitOps automation. Now that GitOps automation is really quite vanilla. It's looking at things in Git and it's applying a customization and delivering them to Kubernetes. So if you saw earlier when I talked about weave GitOps and I said 80% is going to be convention, that programming of the GitOps automation is pretty vanilla. So there's not all that much to do. So that's really, you're already a large part of the way there to GitOps in clusters. Now, what about infrastructure? Now, this one's interesting. For example, we might use something like Pulumi. Now, interestingly, Pulumi has a controller. They have a Pulumi stack controller. They have defined a resource type of a stack and they have provided a controller that runs the things that you would have normally run at the command line if you were using Pulumi. So it runs on your behalf Pulumi up or Pulumi destroy. Now you have to, of course, program the GitOps automation. In this particular case, hey, the stack is defined as um, a, a custom resource already. So as soon as you drop that custom resource in there, all you're doing is checking the Git repository, applying any customizations, and then delivering that YAML out into the Kubernetes cluster. So what you're implementing here is you are simply going to install the Pulumi controller into the repository, uh, in, into your cluster. Now, 
I want to pause here a moment to talk a little bit about something that's different. There's an important um, uh, point to be made. Remembers that controllers run continuously. And because they run continuously, this brings with it the constraint of item potence. At the very beginning of today, I talked about item potence, and it was when we started to recognize the requirement for item potent. And that came first when representational straight state transfer started becoming all the rage, rest, the rest architectural style, was when we started to understand the value of item potence. But the interesting thing here is that it's not the controller alone that's responsible for the automation. The stack, so the custom resource that you've just put in your Git repository, has code in it that looks like this. The stack has the Pulumi script inside of it. Now, if you look at this, and if you're like me, you look at it and you see the for loop and you think, uh-oh, imperative. It's imperative, it's not declarative. Well, it actually turns out that this particular script, even though it looks imperative, it is declarative under the covers. It is smart enough, Pulumi is smart enough to recognize this for loop. And if something has changed, it will look for the changes and apply those changes. But if something, if nothing has changed, then it makes no change in the things that are applied in the cluster. Now that does not mean that every single script every resource that Pulumi offers or Terraform offers support for is item potent. So you need to be very careful here that it isn't, you can't make the statement of, oh, well, Terraform, the Terraform controller is item potent or the Pulumi controller is item potent. You have to look at the actual resource that you, that Pulumi is operating on or Terraform is operating on to ensure that it is item potent. So you're bearing a little bit more of a burden here. And that's why, I can't remember if I did it. Oh, let me go back one slide. That's why I kind of colored the outsides, the bookends here in kind of a warning color. Like this isn't quite as straightforward as cluster API. There's some more things that you need to think about. Okay, so that's infrastructure. And um, so now let's talk about, and of course, cross-plane is another example that can be applied in that, play, in that space. So now let's talk about some of these services, things like databases, search services, messaging, and so on. And here, I'm going to give you a concrete example. Um, this is uh, the, the example, this is just an example of this particular pattern. But notice the green colors on the bookends, and the yellow color in the middle. This is stuff that is already built for you. And the example that I'm pointing to here are the Amazon controllers for Kubernetes. I, I, the Amazon controllers for Kubernetes. What this means is that they have created declarative configuration APIs for a set of services that are available in the AWS marketplace. Some of those services are things like S3, Container Registry, DynamoDB, Autoscaler, those things, they always had REST APIs and they always had consoles that you could use to create and manage the lifecycle of these things. But what Amazon has done is in ACK, they have created a declarative API They've created the custom resources and the controllers that will give you the item potent behavior so that you can apply, apply GitOps to these things. So if you wanna GitOps these services on Amazon, you just need to install the ACK controllers into your cluster. You program the GitOps automation. You know what? In this case, the GitOps automation that we have in WeGo for um, the convention, the two-step retrieve from Git applied to Kubernetes will apply beautifully there as well. So the GitOps automation can be handled with a single command as well. And that gives me a whole bunch of these services. Now that's about all that I have the time for. And I wanted to show you some concrete examples, 
But mostly, I wanted to point out that what you're doing here is, in, is we're, you have to understand what the programming model is. You don't necessarily need to program all these elements. I showed you, for example, that ACK has already programmed the additional controllers that you need to install. It's the controllers here on the right-hand side. Something like WeGo is going to give you the GitOps automations. And so you can apply a number, install a number of things into your Kubernetes environment to be able to get ops some additional things. But this is the programming model that will allow you as an end user, but even more importantly, I am talking to you, the third part, party services providers. This is the programming model that you can use to provide the right things so that our joint customers can get ops all the things. So with that, I think I am just about perfectly on time. I thank you for your attention. I think we have a minute or two for questions. We'll see if there are any questions. I'll stop sharing and I'll invite Tomo back out onto the stage to kind of wrap up this last session of the day and then maybe kind of reflect on the day as a whole.